Hello everybody, welcome to Snyder's Inc. And today, we got another Mr. Ballin one, and this one is... Man does the unthinkable right before takeoff. I have no idea this is going to be, we're going to find out. Ladies and gentlemen, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, comment what you think down below. Let's go. We're going to look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload two or three times every week. So if that's of interest to you, the next time the like button needs a pair of socks, offer to loan them a pair of yours. But make sure they're the kind of socks that immediately slip down under your heel into the shoe as soon as you start walking. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. Let's. Unnamed health issue says this story is based on limited report and small details may be inaccurate. In 1990, 31-year-old John O'Brien was a landscaper in a town just outside of Chicago, Illinois. In January of that year, he and his friend, David, decided they wanted to escape the cold Chicago winter and go on some vacation to somewhere nice and warm. And so they decided to book a trip to the very sunny Caribbean islands of Trinidad and Tobago. They left for their trip just a couple of days later, which was believed to be January 8th or January 9th, and the hotel they were staying in was right near the airport in Trinidad. So they land in Trinidad, they get off their plane, they make their way out of the airport, they go to their hotel, they drop their luggage, and then they headed out to explore the town. And over the next couple of days, they not only explored Trinidad, but also the island of Tobago, which was a four hour boat ride away. And they had great food, they saw some really cool attractions, and just overall, they had a chance to relax in the warm weather while all their friends back home were freezing in Chicago. And so by all accounts, their vacation was going exactly to plan until Sunday the 14th of January. This was the day before they were supposed to fly back to Chicago. That day, John began complaining of some unnamed health issue, which has not been made public, so we don't know what it is, and he went to some drugstore in town in Trinidad to look for a specific medication for this unnamed health issue. But the drugstore did not carry this medication, so John left and he went to another drugstore and another store, but nobody had this medication. And so by the time John it's really weird that he would have a health issue. I'm gonna assume, was it a health issue he always had and he just didn't bring the medication with him that he should have? Was it one that happened in, while they were there, while he was there, and then for some reason they recommended a medication they don't have? I, it's really weird. John got back to the hotel and saw David, David would later remark that John was not only distraught about not having this medication, but John was disoriented. Like whatever this health issue was, it was starting to manifest itself in this kind of disoriented state that John was in because it was not being treated. But eventually David decided that John was okay enough that they did not need to call a hospital or call a doctor. And the two men decided to just go to bed because after don't let a good move. He's disoriented and that from a health issue that involves him needed medication. You should go to a hospital. After all, they had a very early flight the next morning. So the two men climb into their respective beds, which are in the same room, two twin size beds, and they fall asleep. But about an hour to maybe an hour and a half after David had fallen asleep, he wakes up to some man standing next to his bed, choking him. He's grabbing his throat and throttling him. And so David has no time to respond to what's going on. He just starts grabbing this guy's hands and he manages to push them off of him. And then this guy who's standing next to his bed grabs the lamp next to him and smashes David with it. David from getting hit falls out of the bed. He lands on the ground and this guy, his attacker jumps on top of him and the two men are fighting but eventually David manages to overpower this guy and he kicks him off and as soon as he does that he realizes this guy that's been attacking him is John and John is completely naked he's got no clothes on what the fuck is going on why is my man naked why is he attacking his friend naked why is he trying to kill his friend naked what is going on with this man 
And so John just stands up and David's looking at him like, what's going on? And John just runs out of the hotel room. He ends up running down the hall. He goes down the stairs. He runs past the front desk, out the front doors of the hotel and just takes off running. And so John runs for several minutes until he reaches the airport. But instead of going through the front gates, he goes to the side of the front gates where there are these huge chain link fences with barbed wire at the top. And John, again, wearing no clothes, climbs up the chain link fence and then manages to navigate the barbs at the top and drops over onto the other side. But where he landed, although it was on airport property, it was kind of like a trap because this airport had two fences around its perimeter back to back. And so where John landed was like this grassy no man's land between these two fences. But John was on this kind of deranged mission, so he stands up and instead of trying to get back out again, he turns and climbs the next fence, the one that is closer to the airport. And so he climbs up this fence, he manages to get past all the barbed wire at the top, and he drops into the parking lot on the other side. He stands up and just continues running towards the main building of the airport. But between him and the main building of this airport is this huge concrete wall that doesn't look like it has any place to grab onto to to climb over it but John runs up to this wall and manages to climb up and over the wall and where he landed on the other side was right next to this security guard shack and so he comes oh my god am I your security guard and you're sitting there doing your thing and I don't know and some random naked dude just falls down next to you it just falls down and you think you'd be like what the fuck excuse me just just immediately arrest him but like why 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 naked it's probably gonna be your thought crashing down and the four security guards that are in this shack, they see him come over the wall. They see this naked guy just suddenly appear. And so they charge out to apprehend him and figure out what's going on. But John apparently attacked them. We don't know exactly what he did, but he managed to overpower all four of them and he stole their four wheel drive vehicle. And so John just bombs away from the security. This man is this during seat is just losing it. He's just, a t he's over, he's beating up four people. Despite the fact he couldn't beat up his friend, he beat up, he didn't kill his friend, he beat up the four people and stole their vehicle. Jesus Christ. Security guard shack with the four security guards chasing him on foot. And John, he weaves around the outside of the main airport building and he heads out onto the tarmac. Out on the tarmac, there were several planes that were moving into position for takeoff. One of those planes was this huge British Airways jet airliner passenger plane that was actually the next to take off. They'd already fired up their engines and they were sitting at the top of the runway just waiting for clearance. And John just drives directly into this plane. But the vehicle he was driving, this little four-wheel drive vehicle, it was not tall enough to actually strike the main body of this plane. So instead, when he hit this plane, he basically got wedged underneath one of the wings. At this point, the four security guards that had been attacked and had their vehicle stolen from them, I mean, they're running towards the tarmac, but they've also alerted other security personnel in the airport who are all streaming out onto the tarmac towards this British Airways plane and this vehicle and John. And so as they are are descending on the scene, the security guards would see John from the passenger seat of this four wheel drive vehicle. He stands up and they can see he's got a pretty nasty cut on his shoulder. And John reaches up and starts rubbing his hand on the underside of the plane, which had been damaged from running into it. And there was oil leaking off the underside of this plane. And John began rubbing this oil around and then dabbing it into his big wound on his shoulder. And then after packing it with this oil, John leapt out of the wreck four-wheel drive vehicle and then just took off running away from all these security guards and away from this plane and in the chaos of this moment this is so insane what is going on with this dude whatever injury it was it had to have been brain it had to be a brain related injury because no person would be like this if your shoulder hurt or your knee hurt this is some brain mental health brain related stuff moment all these security guards and all the airport personnel that were descending on this scene they managed to lose sight of john he disappeared on the backside of this plane and so all these security guards and airport personnel they come to a stop about a hundred feet away from this plane and this wrecked vehicle and they're just kind of staring at it wondering you know what are we going to do next they're calling other agencies to come in and assist with this situation when all of a sudden somebody notices john about 300 feet away on the other 
other side of the plane, he comes out from behind a building. And so he's running towards the plane, he's running towards this wall of security guards and other airport staff. And John, he manages to get all the way up to the plane before anybody can come up and apprehend him. And when he reaches the plane, he stops for a second, looks up at the engine of this airplane that's still spinning, it's been turned on, and John jumps into the engine. And instantaneously, John ceases to exist. He is- Why would this guy what the f- What psychotic episode did this man have that involved him ending his own damn life? What the hell is wrong with him? What happened to this man? is completely decimated. No one knows for sure what actually caused John's rampage, although it's assumed it had to do with whatever this unnamed health issue was. Ultimately, his death was ruled a suicide. I mean, it is. At the end of the day, it is. It's just so confusing. One of the most dangerous... I guarantee you his family does not believe it was, because they just... I bet his family just could not understand what he did because it doesn't make no sense olympic sports is called luge in a nutshell one or two people who are called losers will ride a sled down a hill as fast as they can but this hill is this narrow winding banked ice track and these losers will ride a sled that will go as fast as 80 miles per hour or faster while accidents in luging are actually quite uncommon when they do occur they can be catastrophic in 1986, a luge track was built on a ski hill in Alberta, Canada for the luge event of the 1988 Winter Olympics. This track and the surrounding ski area was called Canada Olympic Park. After the Olympics were over, this park was open to the public for recreational purposes. Nearly 30 years later, on January 29th, 2016, three teenage boys snuck into Canada Olympic Park after hours. They made their way up the hill until they reached this blue six foot tall fence that was covered with warnings telling people to stay back and don't go past this fence unless you are authorized personnel. And these three teenage boys were not authorized personnel. Inside of this six foot tall blue fence, was what looked like this tall flight of stairs that led up to what looked almost like a log cabin. And that cabin was the starting house of the luge track. The track literally came out of the cabin and fed down below. The three boys, one of which had actually worked at this park the winter before selling tickets, they looked at each other and grinned and then chucked their plastic sleds over this blue fence and then they climbed up and over themselves. Once this is a stupid idea, thought process already. These guys are jump breaking into a park. So this probably is not a good idea. On the other side, they each picked up their sled and then made their way up the stairs into the starting house. Once they were inside, they kind of arranged themselves to see who would go first, second, and third. They put their helmets on because they all brought helmets. They strapped on headlamps so they could see the course because there were no lights on on the course. And then one by one, they began going down this luge track. But surprisingly, it wasn't that fast. As they went down, they would actually stop and have to use their feet to get going again. But that was because they had these cheap plastic sleds that were not designed for this luge course. What you needed were these specialty sleds with blades on the sides that got you up to full speed. And so after the three boys eventually slowly, painfully made their way all the way down to the bottom of this luge track, they were pretty disappointed, but they thought, okay, well, let's just all get in one sled and we'll go down again. And with the added weight, we should go faster. And so they marched their way back up all the way up to the top of the starting house and all three of them sat in one sled and they pushed off and sure enough, they went way faster. They bombed all the way down this track. It was so much fun. They were totally exhilarated. And after doing it a couple more times, this is ridiculous. This is a stupid thought process, man. Shouldn't be doing this. This, this is going to go wrong. We know. I just curious how. they decided okay you know 
I apologize, my friend keeps calling me. Everyone's trying to get a hold of me at one goddamn time. Everyone always does when I'm filming. Our luck's gonna run out, we're gonna get caught. And so they climbed back over that blue fence and snuck out of the park without getting caught. The following weekend, those three same boys, along with five of their friends they had recruited, returned to Canada Olympic Park after hours. And so the three boys that had been there the weekend before, they led the group up the hill. They got to that blue fence that surrounded the luge starting house. And one by one, each of these teenage boys climbed up and over the fence and they made their way up the stairs into the starting house. Once they were inside, they began figuring out who was going to go in each of the three sleds they had brought along. And they determined they would put three boys in the first sled, three boys in the second sled, and two boys in the final sled. Because of how successful the previous weekend's trip down the luge track had been, according to the three boys that had gone, this time the group decided they did not need helmets because this was relatively safe. They also decided not to bring headlamps because they figured it would be more exhilarating to go flying down this track in the darkness. And so a little after- Well this is just stupid, that's just a stupid thought process. That's dipshit thought process. Don't be stupid like that, that's stupid. After midnight on February 6th, the first three boys climbed into the first sled and pushed off. At first, it was going exactly to plan. It was fun, they were going fast, it was exhilarating, but then disaster struck. Unlike the previous weekend, this night, this weekend, there was a metal chain that had been strung across one of the sections towards the bottom of the luge track. It was there to keep a particular section of the track in place. And so these boys, as they come flying around the corner, they don't see it, and they strike this chain at full speed. Now this chain was at neck height, and so when it hit them, it instantly decapitated and killed one of the boys. It was a This guy, Jesus Christ, this guy, so they went and there was this chain put up to keep the track in place. And as they went around, it was at neck height, it hit the chain. They hit the chain and the first guy got instantly beat. Oh my God. Oh my God. A 17 year old named Evan Caldwell and so he dies immediately and the other two are thrown from the sled and landed unconscious. Now back up at the starting house they have no way of knowing this has happened to the first sled not only because they can't see anything but also because the boys in the first sled are not making any sound they're either unconscious or deceased and so at some point the second group of boys thinks they've waited long enough to account for the first sled to get down and out of the way and so they load up their sled and they push off and so they go flying down it's going great but just like the first sled at some point they turn that corner and they hit that chain. But miraculously, the second group of three boys, they hit the chain in such a way that they kind of slipped under it. And so they were all thrown from their sled and kind of smashed into the track, but the worst injury of the second sled was just a broken ankle. And so this group, they stand up and they're totally disoriented. It's dark, they don't know what they just ran into. And before they had a chance to kind of collect their thoughts and yell up to the starting house to try to warn the third and final group not to go, it was already too late. All the boys could do in the second sled group was to just get out of the way as the third and final sled carrying the final two boys came bombing down and they too struck that chain at full speed. One of the two boys on board this third and final sled was a 17 year old named Jordan Caldwell and he too unfortunately would be decapitated by the chain and would die instantly. And he was actually the twin brother of Evan Caldwell Oh my god, both brothers died. Both brothers just happened to be the one that died. Oh my fucking god. That is insane, man. The boy on the first sled who had also died. The other boy on the third sled would be thrown from the sled and would suffer grievous injuries as well. One of the survivors of the crash, who was actually on the first sled, his name was Caleb and he was knocked unconscious from being thrown. When he came to, he was laying in a section of the track that was covered by a tarp and at first he couldn't see anything, he couldn't hear anything, but he just felt like there was something lodged in his throat and it was making it very hard to breathe. Most likely that was just from his throat being cracked 
crushed in from hitting that chain. And so as he's struggling to breathe, his senses began to come back to him and his sight came back and he noticed he was laying down and one of the boys who had been on the second sled was kneeling next to him. This was one of the boys that had not been badly hurt and he had his hand on Caleb's shoulder and he was praying for Caleb to survive. And so as Caleb is taking in that someone is praying over him, he notices somewhere else, his hearing is starting to pick up, he can hear someone else and it would turn out to be a boy named Mark who was on the first sled who had been very badly injured, his face was very badly beaten up. He was laying somewhere nearby and he was just singing this religious song. He was trying to keep spirits high and he was trying to will people to hold on and to survive as long as they possibly could. And then Caleb remembered hearing someone calling 911 and then he doesn't remember what happened next. When the paramedics ultimately arrived within the hour, they got to the track and they found all of these boys spread out all over the track because when they hit this chain, they got sent flying. But they discovered the twins were actually laying right next to each other and none of these surviving boys had moved their bodies. And so even though the grief was just unfathomable amongst this family that had lost their two sons, there was some solace in the fact that despite having come down in different sleds, that the twins, Evan and Jordan, were together in their final moments. The six survivors of this accident would walk away from it with life-changing head injuries and other medical issues, and they would walk away with an indescribable sense of guilt and regret. But they consider themselves lucky because at least they survived. I guess that makes sense. I mean, they just consider themselves super lucky to be, have been able to survive this, but they have guilt because two men, two brothers, both died as a result of this foolishness that they did here. IQ, which stands for Intelligence Quotient, is a measure of someone's intelligence. To find your IQ, you need to take an official IQ test, which gives you an IQ score. The vast majority of people will score about 100 as their IQ, and so that's considered to be the average intelligence for any given person. But a very small number of people will score somewhere between 130 and 160. And so that's considered to be a very high IQ. Those are very, very gifted people. And then there is an even smaller group of people that score above 160. And so that is the genius class. Anybody who scores above 160 is literally a genius. To give you a sense of just how rare that is, Albert Einstein, who is largely considered to be one of the smartest people to have ever lived, he was not even considered a genius, at least not by his IQ. He was about 160, so right on the cusp of geniusness. But as we will learn from this story, having an exceptionally high IQ does not make you immune to making unfathomably bad choices. In 1991, 31 year old Jackie Katarik, who had a genius IQ of 170, so she was smarter than Albert. Albert Einstein, she graduated from UCLA Medical School with honors. She completed her medical residency, which is like a multi-year apprenticeship for new doctors, at Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles, which is one of the very best hospitals in America. After that, she opened... Sorry, I kind of just wanted to bring this up. The fact that like Albert Einstein wasn't even fully a genius in comes to IQ standards is shocking and it shows how little, how small that IQ thing is to be considered a genius. But as he put it perfectly, just because you have uh, your genius in IQ does not mean you can't make really stupid bad choices. I don't think we're going to see the example of that here. I'm just curious how stupid it's going to be opened her very own practice just north of LA in a town called Bakersfield, California, and she also became a part-time professor at her alma mater, UCLA. By all accounts, Jackie was brilliant, she was successful, and she loved what she did, and her patients and her students loved her right back. Fast forward to 2010, Jackie was 49 years old, and she was still running her very successful practice, and she was still teaching at UCLA, 
and she was in an on-again, off-again relationship with a 58-year-old man named William Moody. While the details of their relationship are not really publicly known, it's fairly easy to deduce from the reporting that came from this case that Jackie and William fought a lot. On Wednesday, August 25th of that year, Jackie was spotted by herself at a Mediterranean restaurant in Bakersfield, California, having some drinks. And then at some point during the night, she called a ride service to pick her up and take her home again. Even though we don't know this for sure, it's assumed she was too intoxicated to drive and that's why she called the ride service. The following morning, Jackie did not show up for work. Her assistant at her medical practice is the one who noticed Jackie had not shown up. And so when she didn't, she called her boss, but her boss didn't pick up. And so after a couple of failed attempts at getting in touch with Jackie, this assistant called Jackie's boyfriend, William. And so William, he picks up the phone. And when the assistant asks him, hey, have you seen Jackie? She has not come into work today. William actually says, yes, I saw her last night. William would explain to the assistant that the night before he was in his house by himself in Bakersfield, California, not far from this restaurant where Jackie was last seen. And he said that at some point, unannounced, he saw Jackie pull up in front of his house. And so he could tell from her general demeanor and her look and her pace that she was upset about something or he just sensed there was going to be some conflict if he went to the door. And so he decided to actually slip out the back door and kind of run away from his property before Jackie could see him. And so he actually left the property and went to a friend's house who was nearby and spent the night. So this girl showed up drunk, pretty much ready to argue and fight with this man, and this guy went not nah, snuck out his back door and went to a friend's to avoid this woman. Fair enough. With this friend. And so when the assistant called William, William was actually still at this friend's house. He had not been back to his actual property. And so he would tell the assistant that, you know, the last I saw of Jackie, it was late at night. She had pulled up in front of my house, but then I split, so I don't know what she did. I assume she left. But William would tell the assistant that, you know what, I'll go back over to my house and I'll see if she's still there or if there's some indication of where she might have gone. And so William hangs up the phone. He leaves his friend's house and walks the couple of blocks back to his own property. And when he gets there, sure enough, right out front of his house is Jackie's car. Now, William knew his house was locked and Jackie didn't have a key. And so Jackie must just be sitting in her car waiting for him to return. And so William walks up to the car expecting to see Jackie and expecting probably to fight about something. But when he gets up to the car, Jackie's not in there, but her purse, her cell phone, her wallet, that's all over the inside of the car. And so William turns and looks at his house thinking, is she in the house? Did she somehow get in? Is, is she on the back of the house? And so William just starts yelling out for Jackie as he begins to walk around his house. And so as he goes around towards the back of the house, he's yelling out for Jackie, no one's calling back. And then he reaches the back of the house and there's no sign of Jackie, but he sees there's a shovel on the ground near his back door. And then he looks at his back door and it looks very obviously like someone, probably Jackie, had been using the shovel to try to pry open the back door. Like they were trying to break in, but it hadn't worked. And so Damn Jackie, what the hell's wrong with you? You just had a, someone doesn't knock and let you in, so your response is to break down the door? What the hell's wrong with you? That's already stupid. So William just kind of sees that and then continues walking around the other side of the house. So he's completely walked around the entire property. There's no sign of Jackie. And so he's thinking, okay, I guess she must have gotten in somehow. She's in the house somewhere. And so William goes to the front door. He unlocks his front door. He goes inside. And even though he knows all of his doors have been locked, all the windows are locked, he's kind of on edge because he's thinking she's got to be in here. But he walks through his house and there's no sign of Jackie. And there's no sign that anybody else had been in there since he was last in there. And so he's totally puzzled because it doesn't really make any sense that Jackie's car is out front, but he's thinking, okay, you know, maybe she got here and then she called a ride service and went somewhere else. You know, I'm sure she's fine. So William calls the medical assistant and says, look, you know, her car is here, her stuff's here, but she's not here. I don't know what she's doing. I'll let you know if anything comes of it. The assistant said, I really feel like something's off here and we really do need to call the police. And so William would say, you know what? I think that's a good idea too. Let's just get them involved and make sure she's okay. And so they call the police and- Okay, so at least he's not suspicious. She's like, I think we should call the police. He's like, you know what? That, yeah, this is very weird. Cause at least in worst case, if they find her, then we know she's okay. But yeah, we should probably figure out what the hell is going on here. 
The police start by going to Jackie's residence, but Jackie's not there and there's no sign of her. The neighbors haven't seen her. And so the police go to William's household and they search Jackie's car and they search William's house and the surrounding area right outside. But there's really no clues as to what actually happened to Jackie. And so after the police talked to a bunch of neighbors and friends and family, they just told William and this medical assistant that at this point, they just need to wait and that hopefully Jackie will just come out of wherever it is she's hiding or wherever she's gone. Maybe she's upset. Maybe she was fighting with William and she's run off somewhere, but we just got to wait and see what happens. Two days later, Jackie was still unaccounted for. No one knew where she was. No one had heard from her. No one had seen her when William's friend went over to his house. William, the day before, so 24 hours after Jackie had been reported missing, he had left the country on a prearranged trip but he was not being looked at as a potential suspect or having anything to do with Jackie's disappearance. And so he was allowed to go. And so this friend had been asked to go to his property to feed his fish. And so he shows up on Saturday, that's 48 hours after Jackie has been reported missing. He goes inside the house and immediately he's hit with this terrible smell inside of William's house. And so he's covering his face and he's walking around the house trying to figure out where the smell is coming from. He thinks it could be the fridge, maybe something's rotting that's fallen out or the door's open open or something, but it's not the fridge. He goes to the trash. It's not the trash. He goes to the fish. It's not the fish. He makes his way over to the fireplace and he realizes that's where the smell is coming from. And so kind of reluctantly, he gets down and he kind of smells inside the fireplace, but it's not really coming from the area where the logs would be. It's coming from up in the chimney flue. And so he puts his head down and kind of turns and looks up the chimney and about two feet up the flue dangling down are two human legs and they would be Jackie's legs. It would turn out a few days earlier when Jackie was at that restaurant drinking by herself, she did call that ride service to come give her a ride home, presumably because she was too intoxicated to drive. But before they showed up, Jackie just got into her car anyways and drove to her estranged boyfriend's house. And so she gets there. William, meanwhile, is sneaking out the back and running off to his friend's house. Jackie does not see him. She makes her way up to the front door and presumably tries to knock and get William's attention but when no attention is given to her and it seems like no one's inside, she decides she's gonna try to get into the house. And so the front door was locked, the windows were all locked, she got to the back door and that was locked. So she tried the shovel and tried to pry it open, but it didn't work. And so eventually Jackie climbed up the permanent ladder that's on the back of the house. There isn't much online describing this permanent ladder. It could be a fire escape or it could be some sort of lawn decoration, but there was something on the back of the house that you could climb up if you wanted to. And so Jackie climbed up this permanent ladder and actually got onto the roof. And then when she was on the roof, she walked to the center where the chimney was, and there was this cap over the top of the chimney to prevent things from going into the chimney. She removed the cap and then lowered herself feet first into this chimney. This just seems stupid. How did she think this was a good idea? I mean, I know she was drunk, but alcohol can't make someone whose IQ is 170 turn them into a complete other imbecile. Because this is next level stupid. Now it's unclear. How did she think this would work? how quickly she descended this chimney, but eventually she got stuck because the width of this chimney was not uniform. It started fairly wide at the top and then narrowed as it went down. And so at some point, as she went down feet first, she would have gotten completely wedged. It wouldn't have mattered if her hands were above her head or by her side, because either way, they were useless. She couldn't bend her arms and there was nothing to grab onto, so her arms couldn't do anything. And then below her, there was nothing for her feet to push onto. And so she was totally stuck. And since William was not in his house, he had left, there was no one there to help her. And so Jackie probably started screaming for help, but as soon as she did that and she exhaled that huge scream, her chest would have constricted from exhaling and that would have shrunk her chest, making her thinner and she would have dropped a little bit farther into the chimney. And then when she breathed back in again, her chest would not be able to expand back to its original position because the chimney would be restricting her. It's like this brace that's around her chest that as she gets lower and lower and lower, it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And so her lung capacity is shrinking second by second. And as her lung capacity shrinks, she would not have had the lung strength to emit a loud enough sound to get anybody's attention. Basically, she couldn't scream. She couldn't take in a big enough breath to scream out. 
And so she was just stuck in this totally compromised position in this claustrophobic little chimney where she could do nothing but wait and hope maybe William or someone took notice of the fact that she was in here, even though, again, she couldn't get anyone's attention. And so most likely she would have begun rationing her breaths because, again, every time she breathes out too much, she goes farther and farther, making it harder and harder to breathe. And at some point, starting on Thursday night, she would have heard William in the house. He would have been only a few feet away from her, but she can't make a sound loud enough to get his attention. And we know she was alive by Thursday night because neighbors heard someone faintly yelling help on Friday night. So nearly 48 hours after she got stuck in the chimney, it's believed she was still alive. And those neighbors, when they heard that faint call for help, they assumed it was kids in a nearby pool, and so they didn't do anything about it. When they found out what had happened, they thought, you know what, it, it was coming from that chimney. That's where we heard it coming from. Jackie would... I don't... I still hate that. I still hate that when they're like... Well, it's probably coming from like a house all the way down there. It, it's fine. Then we're like, yeah, someone died near there. Like, you know what? It was coming from... Well, yeah, it was coming from there. That does make sense. I hate that die shortly after the neighbors heard her calling for help because she was dead by the time the friend found her in the chimney the following day on Saturday. Jackie would die from mechanical asphyxia, which is basically suffocation, but it's caused by some physical obstruction. And in this case, it was the chimney. The chimney literally crushed her chest to the point where she could no longer inflate her lungs. It would take firefighters approximately five hours to break this chimney down to finally retrieve Jackie's body. No charges were filed against anyone for Jackie's death. It was ruled to be an accident, an accident caused by an unbelievable error in judgment by an unbelievably brilliant woman. So that's going to do it, guys. Genius doing a stupid choice. What a goddamn shocker. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching this video. Let me know what you thought about in the comments. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all for the next one.